The following podcast is created and sponsored by High Beam Ministry. Who is there? Special delivery. You're most likely familiar with the Ten Commandments in the Bible, stuff we generally take as good advice. Don't murder, don't steal, honor your parents, the list goes on. And those are just the first ten. There are actually a total of 613 commands, all given to ancient Israel, found in the first five books of the Bible, which in Hebrew are called the Torah. Now the word Torah is usually translated in English as the law, because it has all of these laws in it. And as you read through them, you wonder, Am I supposed to obey some of these? All of these? I mean, what's the purpose of the law? Well, that translation is kind of confusing because while the Torah has laws in it, the book itself is fundamentally a story about how God is creating new kinds of people who are fully able to love God and love others. And when Jesus taught about the Torah, he said that he was bringing that story to its fulfillment. Welcome to the Airzatz Coffee Shop. This is Jay, your truth barista, and I'm serving up a steamy cup of God's truth for the average Joe. You can catch me and this podcast on my websites, truthbarista.com, all one word, truthbarista.com, and highbeamministry.com. That's H I G H B E A M ministry.com, as in car high beam. We're shining the light of God's truth on the road ahead. What a day. Hey, Larry, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. I, I'm just a tad bit confused. Oh, what about? Well, you know, I'm, I've got all these different friends, right? I've got my cell group leader, my small group leader, and he tells me things like this, that as Christians, we have everything we need in Christ. We don't have to go back to the OT or the Old Testament for anything other than maybe a history lesson, and there's some good stories there that depict faith. But that's about it. Then I have this messianic friend, this, this Jewish friend who has accepted Christ as Savior, and he says, says, oh, no, 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 you have to keep Torah, you have to keep the law, and that's in addition to following Christ. So, I don't know where all this stuff comes together. Well, you know, hey, let's take a seat here. I'll put my coffee cup down here. All and, right. Okay. Well, my quick answer is they are both right and they are both wrong. Hmm. Let me explain. You know, that's a little bit like a politician, if you ask well, me. Well, no, it's actually kind of very rabbinic. <laughs> you know, yes and no, on one hand, on the other yeah. hand. Yeah. But let me unwind this here for you. First of all, your cell group leader is right in the sense that in Jesus we have everything we need. He's wrong in the sense that we don't need the Old Testament because it's all the Word of God. We just have to figure out how it all comes together. Regarding your other friend, he's wrong in the sense of we need Torah, and it sounds like he's saying we need Torah to be saved? Well, in some ways, yes. He may not say it in quite those words, but that's kind of what I gather from it, that yes, it's Christ plus keeping Torah gets you to the point of salvation. Okay, now he's wrong about that, but he is right in the sense that Torah is very important, you know, which is most Christians would know the Torah by its other name, the law, which is actually kind of a misnomer. It's kind of a wrong way to refer to it because the Torah actually comes from related Hebrew words meaning to teach and to throw at a target. So rather than just being a law such as you break it, you die, you keep it, you're mm -hmm. blessed kind of a mm -hmm. thing, a judicial thing, mm -hmm. you got to think of the, the law, the Torah in terms of guidelines. Now, one of the best pictures that comes to mind is picture yourself driving down the road. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are those silver things you see on either side of the highway? Well, they're guideposts, aren't they? Or some sort of a marker? Well, they're not just guideposts. They're barriers. Barriers. Okay. Right, because you know if you're going to drift mm -hmm. and fall asleep, you don't want right. to be driving off the edge and over a cliff or whatever. So you've got right. these boundaries, you've got these barriers. Well, the Torah is the boundaries that God has set forth for us. And he's basically saying you stay between the boundaries, you're staying on the right path. If you go over or through the boundaries, now you're on the wrong path. Do you get it? I do. So Christ is the end of my journey. I mean, he is the end of all truth. He is it. And so what we need to do is sort of unpack how we got there. In other words, how we got to, to the Messiah through the relationship that the Jews had with God through Abraham. Because I think that's some of the foundational things we miss, isn't it? Right. To understand 
the place of the Torah in a Christian's life. Yes. Okay. We have got to look at the pattern from the beginning. Right. And I found that the most helpful thing. So let's go back to the beginning. And let's go even farther back than Abraham. Okay. When Adam and Eve were created, they walked right with God, correct? Correct. Okay. God says, you got one command here. (laughs) Okay. This is your command. Mm. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But they broke that command. They exercised their self-will and they rebelled against that command. They broke it. What's the punishment for breaking that command? Death. They were going to die, which means being separated from God. They broke the boundary and went over the cliff. God is not content with that. He wants to redeem and restore his people back to the way they were. Correct. But because we had broken the boundary, we became broken inside. And so now humanity needs boundaries, God-given boundaries, to keep us on the path. If we don't have boundaries, and everybody, Larry, kind of calls the law according to the how they feel like it or what's right and wrong, can you imagine what a barbaric world we'd be living in? Well, that's true, and that's that was always one of my questions, is that, well, I mean, why do we have to have a law? I mean, can't we just get along? I mean, know God and get along. Why is the law necessary? Because we can't be trusted. Everybody's got their self-interest, right? And my self-interest at times is going to clash with your self-interest. And if I'm a law unto myself and you're a law unto yourself, there's coming a time, Mm. as we've seen in our past relationship, when we're going to butt heads. Right. And suddenly I can do something that according to me seems right, but according to you is wrong. Correct. Okay, so we really as human beings, twisted and bent as we are, and outside of God's direction, his firm highway, the right way, we really do need his boundaries because he created us. He is loving. He is just. He is right. He is perfect. So therefore, he is the one to tell us what is right and what is wrong. So then as we move from Adam and Eve, in your example here, to Abraham, he's now choosing a people for what purpose in Abraham? This is part of God's plan of restoring all things. He finds a man, Abraham, who trusts him. So he gives him the word, and Abraham goes through this process of learning how to trust God. And then from Abraham comes one son, Isaac. From Isaac comes the son, Jacob. And from Jacob, it grows into 12 family groups or tribes. Jacob and these family groups go down to Egypt and because of a famine, and they all live there. The problem is, over time, Egypt exerts control. Their king takes control of them. And in the meantime, Israel is growing these 12 tribes into quite a huge group. By the time of the Exodus, there's 600,000 men. So you're talking maybe a nation of people who are 1.5 million or so. Okay, so they cry out to their God on the basis of the covenant he made or the contract he made with Abraham. God says, I'm going to Get rid of that king, I'm going to free you from that kingdom, and I'm going to be your king, as it was always intended, as I promised Abraham. So God goes through the whole Exodus thing, destroys the king, the Pharaoh, and his army, and now Israel is free, and they're in kind of no man's land in the wilderness, and God goes, aha! I am now your king. You are now my people. And now this is what we are going to do. Wow, I guess I never heard God speak like that. I know, he's kind of amazing, isn't it? (laughs) So anyway, what happens is God then proposes to the people. He says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And this is going to be the terms of our relationship. Did you know there's an ancient word for that? No, I didn't. It's called a covenant. It oh, more specifically, that covenant. a suzerain vassal covenant or a king-servant covenant. Back in those days, a king would often defeat a weaker king, take his people into his kingdom and say, I'll be your king, you be my people, this is the law of the land. You'll live according to the laws of the land, you'll be blessed, I'll take care of you, you'll be wonderful, you'll like it. It's going to be huge, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> It'll be huge. Okay, or he says, if you break the laws of the kingdom, then there will be punishment. But what's also interesting in all of these covenants, even if you break the terms of the covenant, there's always a reinstatement clause. If you turn back to me, I'll make sure that there's a system that takes care of your infraction, pays for your your fine for you, and you can come back into the relationship that we had, the right relationship. That's exactly what happened at Mount Sinai with Moses. God says, I'll be your pe- I'll be your God, you'll be my people. Here's the Torah. Here's my commandments, my guidelines, my statutes, summed up in the word Torah. In other words, I saved you from Egypt. 
Now this is how we're going to live. Got it? I do have it. What okay. happens after that? All now right. they have their Torah, they have their laws, their policies, their rules. Now I'm going to jump know. like 800 years, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, in the process from Sinai, they go into Israel, they conquer the, the peoples there, and they become a nation. Mm -hmm. The problem is, right away in the book of Judges, you see the people start struggling with God, and they start walking away from him. Over time, Israel becomes a big nation under King Saul and then King David, but because of rebellion against God and breaking his laws, he splits the kingdom into two, to a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. One's called Israel, one's called Judah. And God, by the way, in his law says this, If you, Israel, disobey me, here's the final punishment. I'm going to take you out of the land that I gave you. That is like the bottom line punishment that Israel can can follow. So because of their idolatry over this 800 roughly year period, God finally ejects the northern kingdom of Israel and disperses them among southern Asia, you know, all the way over toward India by the Assyrians, and the southern kingdom are taken away by Babylon. But they were pretty wicked in that north, weren't they? Oh, yeah. Uh, they everything. totally ran away from God. Okay. Judah struggled a little bit, but they still fell. Okay. Okay. So then God says, now this is what I'm going to do. And along comes this really interesting prophecy from Ezekiel, who was in the Babylonian exile, and Jeremiah who is a prophet just before Judah was exiled. These are the prophecies that are really intense. Israel's heart wasn't in it, right? So they found it hard to follow God's laws. God says, when I send you to the nations, you're going to learn your lesson, and I'm going to bring you back. But now things are going to change. Ezekiel 11 says this. Here, I'll pull out my Bible here. Okay. I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. I will remove their heart of stone from their bodies and give them a heart of flesh so they may follow my statutes, keep my ordinances, and practice them. Then they will be my people and I will be their God. Ezekiel 36 says something really similar. For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all countries and will bring you into your own land. I will also sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your impurities and your idols. See, that was the big issue. Then he says in verse 26 of Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. Then you will live in the land that I gave your fathers. You'll be my people and I'll be your God. They're very similar. What is God saying? You're having a really hard time following my laws. You're having a real hard time cooperating in this kingdom. And it's because of your heart. you got a rebellious heart. But I'm going to fix that. Through a certain process, I'm going to take out that rebellious heart, that nature. We call it a sin nature. Correct. Okay. We're gonna, I'm going to take that out. I'm going to replace it with a new nature. And I'm going to put my spirit in you. Okay. So instead of the spirit and everything being outside, I'm going to put them inside. And then I'm going to cause you to walk according to my ways. You know, when you're interior motivated, it's a lot easier to do something. Because I'm doing it because I want to, not because I have, have to. to. But that means that this is what they call a sea change. It's a major shift in God's relationship with his people. Think about how profound this is. Larry, the issue that Adam and Eve, that was a sea change. They went from obeying God by nature to rebelling against God by nature. What God is talking about here in these scriptures, there's coming a time when they're going to go from a rebellious nature and God's going to change it back into an obedient nature. And that's going to make it easier to walk God's ways. Do you follow me so far? I do. And up until this time, everything God does in relationship with his people is basically external. You obey me. Now it's going to be an internal relationship, which will be, I hope, easier easier, right, for the people to obey. Well, look at this one, Jeremiah 31. He says, look, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Wait a minute. There was an old covenant that was done or an older covenant called the Mosaic Covenant at Sinai. God says, I'm going to just kind of change this a little bit. A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. See, those are the two kingdoms. This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. See, they got saved. A covenant they broke even though I had married them. So you can look at this as a husband-wife thing where the wife goes astray. And God says, you know something? I'm going to bring that woman back. I'm going to bring that woman back, but we've got the same terms as we had before, marriage terms, but I'm going to change her heart so she'll want to follow after me. Got it? Now in verse 33 of Jeremiah 31, instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Notice now it's a single house, one people. 
I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. Here's something you got to focus on. That word teaching is Torah. It's more than just laws. It's his boundaries, his guidelines, the way to walk with him will now be written on our hearts. He's actually going to be speaking it from inside rather than speaking it to us from the outside. So another way that we could interpret this would be that there is this sea change now, an internal relationship with God that's administered to by the Holy Spirit. Right. If you were to take these three verses and put them all together because they are all related about a return back to God to be his people and you put them all together, here's the summary. He's going to give us a new heart and a new spirit, his Holy Spirit, and he'll take up residence in us. The purpose of that is to cause his people, us, and help us live obediently to his statutes and ordinances. This is the evidence that we really are God's people. When we walk according to the king's ways, we demonstrate he is our king and we are his subject. But the interesting piece here is I'm understanding this, and correct me if I'm wrong, that this new covenant is given to the Jews, Judah and Israel, and he makes those two divided kingdoms as one, uh -huh. but it's given to basically the Jews. You're right. And not then not, you the, not the, the Christians or Gentiles. Right, except at the Last Supper. Now think back. I mean, you're familiar with the Last Supper. Yeah, I've, seen, I've seen pictures. <laughs> okay. They're at the Last Supper, and Jesus is telling them about Passover, and he's using the picture of Passover as the lamb that, was, that shed its blood so that Israel wouldn't die but be saved. See, the Egyptians were going to lose their firstborn children. But for the Jews, God says, I'll allow a sacrifice. I will allow a lamb to die in place of your son so that you may be saved. You see the picture? I do. I okay, do. at the Last Supper, Jesus says, and by the way, he picks up the matzah, which represents the Messiah, and he goes, this is my body that will be broken for you. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to be the sacrifice. And then he picks up the blood or the wine, which represents the blood of the Passover lamb. And he goes, and this is the blood of the new covenant. covenant. Going back to Jeremiah 31, right. 31. And he's talking to Jewish disciples. And Correct. he's going, I am going to be the agent that constructs and puts into motion the new covenant. How is it going to happen? My body is going to be the sacrifice and my blood is going to seal it. You follow me so far? Boy, that is so good. I, you know, I, I never really connected that before, but Jesus was relying on Jeremiah as he was doing that uh, that Last Supper. Okay, he's pulling all of these things he together. Is. Now, if you bring in everything else with it, if Jesus is a sacrifice and his blood signs the covenant, then all of these other things are going to happen as well. When somebody enters the new covenant, their nature will be changed through the power of the Holy Spirit coming into them, the, be, the person of the Holy Spirit coming into them. Them. Their nature will change to a nature that wants to follow God, and then he's going to start moving you according to God's ways, which, by the way, God's ways are his commands. His Torah. Exactly. In other words, God's going to say, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to show you and keep you between the boundaries if you will cooperate with me. So, and that is all eventually that is fulfilled in Christ. Right. So how do the Gentiles, because this thing here that you're talking up to this point is still is all Jews. Strictly the Jews. Right. So what happens to the okay, Gentiles? Okay, well, not long after Jesus ascends, Peter is called to a centurion's house. He's a Gentile. As he is telling them about the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, and the new covenant, bam! Cornelius and the whole household is hit with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwelling a person is the sign of being in the new covenant. Peter's going, oh, we didn't even like immerse them for conversion yet, and we didn't even circumcise them, and yet God gave them the Holy Spirit. So therefore, Gentiles can come into the new covenant by virtue of the Holy Spirit indwelling them. And I think we hear hear people say that that's the grafting in then, grafting yep, in. And that's what Paul picks up in right. Romans 9 through 11. We have been now grafted into Israel. Israel hasn't been grafted into the church. Right. The church, the Gentiles who come to faith in Jesus are grafted into the commonwealth of Israel through a Jewish Messiah who made a Jewish new covenant based on the Jewish Torah. 
So what you're saying to me, if I can just interpret it in, in Lariaism, is that Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. Absolutely not. He didn't not. come to start Christianity. He came to fulfill the role that God had given the Jews. I mean, the promises that God gave the Jews, he came to fulfill all of that. And Israel was the starting point. Then he looks at his Jewish disciples and says, go make disciples of all ethnos, all nations. The goal is to reach all of humanity, and the desire is to bring them all into the new covenant, if they will, and they do it through the sacrifice of Yeshua in a new covenant signed by his blood. And that goes back to the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis 12, 3, where he says, all the earth will, will be, blessed. be blessed through you. That's and the Abraham fulfillment. was the starting point of the restoration process. Jesus is the core of the restoration process, and by the time you get to Revelation, the restoration process is complete. Okay, but getting back to this issue of the Torah and the law, how does that affect Christians now? Because that's a big discussion in Messianic groups right now, and the church in general totally rejects the Torah as far as anything pertaining to us. Okay, it's it's history. Whereas in some Hebraic Jewish circles, Messianic Jewish circles, it's, well, you have to do Torah. Okay, the key point is Acts 15, because Jews came up and said, wait a minute, if we're Jewish and we have to get circumcised and then follow the Torah in order to maintain our salvation or to be saved and maintain our salvation, what about these Gentiles? Well, Peter says, well, they got the Holy Spirit before they got circumcised. And the Torah, just slapping the Torah on a bunch of people that have no frame of reference on this thing is going to be really tough to do. And James, and he goes, and by the way, God gave him the Holy Spirit. So God's already said, they're in. Okay, James, actually Jacob, would be Jesus's brother, half-brother. He's the head rabbi at the Church of Jerusalem and makes the decision. He goes, this is what we're going to require of the Gentile. No idolatry, no immorality, no shedding of innocent blood, and keep kosher. Okay, that's the strangled animals thing. What James did is he gave them the three core things that defile the land according to the Torah. Idolatry, immorality, and innocent bloodshed. And then he gave them an interesting thing, the kosher law. Okay, he just kind of did it in shorthand. What does that mean? Well, if Gentiles were coming into a synagogue, Gentiles shouldn't be bringing pork and shellfish into a Jewish fellowship. It's gonna, it's kind of going to wreck lunch, you know? Yeah, I, I think it would. Yeah. So what he's saying is, listen, these are the three things we will expect and demand of the Gentiles, and we're going to ask them to keep kosher in these fellowship meetings in order to have fellowship. And then he says something really interesting, Larry. He says, for Moses is taught in every city. What does that mean? If the Gentiles are coming into a Jewish system of religion, they're entering a Jewish sect, where are they going to go to church? There are no Gentile churches. There's no Christian church. It's only synagogues with Messianic and non-Messianic believers in it. If Gentiles are going to come in to learn about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're going to go to synagogue. What is preached in the synagogue? The Torah. Right. And he's basically saying, yes, they're saved by Jesus, but now you learn how to walk with him. Just like Israel was saved from Egypt, and then they learned how to walk with him. So we're saved through Jesus from the kingdom of darkness. Now we need to learn God's word on how to walk with him. And James is pointing to the Torah as their instruction manual. See, God gives us righteousness in Jesus. We walk it out by learning the instruction manual. And I'll add all of God's word. See, I don't put Torah above the rest of the word. That, well, that's important to make note. Right? And I don't put Paul or the Gospels or anything else above the Torah. It is all one level, Genesis mm -hmm. through Revelation. It is his story. Exactly. And we're actually in practice right now by walking God. Well, what if we make a mistake? Well, the Torah says you can come back to God and kind of re up your commitment, mm -hmm. but it takes a, oh, you got to pay a price. There's a repentance. Right. But changing if God, ways. If God demanded every person who sinned to die, the world would be emptied in a hurry. Right. But he said, I'll let you have a sacrifice. And so the Torah sets up the pattern for the reality that we see in Jesus. So the sacrifice, of course, was that renewal process to bring about reconciliation. Yes. And so, me. and then Jesus came and he did it once and for all. Right. right? For all time, that reconciliation. There, because there's a difference between a human being and an animal. Correct. Now, Jesus is unique because he's called what? He's the living word. He is the word of God. So in a sense, what is Jesus? Look at it this way. 
Jesus is what a human being would look like if they walked God's Torah perfect. Mm. And because he was perfect, he qualifies as a blemish-free sacrifice according to the Torah. So now, basically, the Torah says he is the one who is acceptable to God as a sacrifice on your behalf. Wow. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and says, now this is the way you walk. Well, some Christians say, well, don't we just have to love? Because Jesus says, love sums up the Torah and the prophets. It says sums up not replace. Right. So if you want to learn how to love, you should really go back and read the Torah and read the prophets according to how the Holy Spirit would help you interpret it. And by the way, find a good, godly, spirit-filled Torah teacher for this. Okay. Mm-hmm. But as you walk through it, you will start learning how to walk in a loving way, loving toward God and loving toward humanity. Too often today, love is autonomous, or it's taught to be autonomous, where people will say, well, love wins. Love is outside of all framework. Therefore, you can love whoever you want. You can believe in same-sex marriage, on and on and on it goes. But that's not love, because love is tethered to the law, or tethered to the Torah. It has standards, foundation, by which you can understand what love is. Otherwise, it's willy-nilly. Yeah, I mean, like we talked about before, if I say, this is my version of love, that's your version of love, they may not necessarily agree, right? right. And if Jesus says love sums up the law, the bor- the boundaries, the parameters, and the prophets, then therefore, in order to love, you have to have some boundaries for love to be fully expressed the way God wants it to be. To have love without those parameters is a lawless love and not love at all. And this is why you see people who are out there who are proclaiming this kind of wishy-washy Rob Bell, if I can say it, kind of lawless love, there's no sense of it. Because then whatever I feel loving or desirous or affection of qualifies as good to me, but it can still hurt another person and violate God's boundaries. You know, and so if people are wanting to vet some of the things or all of the things that we said here, what would be a good place where they could start besides probably sending you an email and kind of asking you some of their questions? Your email address is? The email address is thetruthbarista at gmail.com. And it's all one word, thetruthbarista, B-A-R-I-S-T-A, at gmail.com. Okay, and say they do that. What was something else you would recommend? Is there a book of the Bible or some Bible commentary text or book that could help them? There are some really good ones out there by Dr. Marvin Wilson, Our Father Abraham, books by Dr. Brad Young, talking about Jesus, the Jewish theologian, talks about these kinds of things. Well, I feel I've been to seminary here, Truth Barista, but you... I hope that kind of clarifies Oh, the issue. boy. I, I'm prepared now for having a conversation with both my friends, my uh, small group leader, as well as my Messianic Jew. Thank you. One thing I have to add before I head out here is this. Jesus alone saves us. God saves us first and only. Period. Period. The second thing is, if we're going to love God and love people, we should read his word to find out how to do it, what to do, what not to do. And by the way, you find it clearly stated in the Torah and throughout all of his word, and we cannot place one part of the Bible above the other. You can't say Jesus only and ignore the rest, but Jesus only for salvation, but the rest shows us how to walk out the salvation we've been given. Good explanation. I look forward for the next time we sit down and we talk through some of these things. We are presenting God's truth for our day. You're listening to The Truth Barista, a production of HighBeamMinistry.com. You know, sometimes I think I've heard everything. And then I came across the High Beam Ministry website. I was blown away. I had no idea how much I could learn about God, the Bible, and life issues from the weekly Truth Barista podcast and Frothy Thoughts blog. Yep, there it was. Riveting discussions, incredible Bible studies, and even a few really dumb jokes. And now I don't want to miss one podcast or one blog post drop. So, I hit the subscribe button on the webpage. Now, when I get a weekly email notice of a new podcast or blog post, 
I grab a cup of joe and settle down for some scintillating insights. Why don't you do the same? Go to highbeamministry.com. All one word, highbeamministry.com, as in car high beams. Check it out. Hey, you kids, get off my lawn. This is Jay, your Truth Barista. Thanks for listening to the Truth Barista podcast. The best way to find out when a new podcast drops is through RSS feed. Go to our website, look for the RSS button, press it, and then enter your email. You'll be notified when a new podcast drops. Thanks for listening.